Guys, welcome back to Medical Society. We're a bigger audience today. And today we're going to be talking about airway management in anesthesia. Now, I've put some pictures on the board. Can anyone tell me which one might be related to airway? Yeah, go on. Uh, Left. All of them. Which one? All of them. No. Yeah. Anyone else? <laughs> yep. The second one. Second one, yep. That is related to airway management. Now, what could be a complication of airway management? There is also another image. The third one? This is not, it's not the third one. Anyone else want to get? Yeah, the I mean, first one. Not the first one. <laughs> yes. The brain. Not the brain. <laughs> the fourth one. The fourth one actually represents frailty, which is like old age. And the older you become, the, the increase of complications um, occurs. The third one is a neuroaxial block, which is used for, for example, um, when you're going to give birth. And that actually, you know, well, tends to relax the mus um, muscles, but also reduces pain as well. This one's a hemorrhage. And this one here is transport, which is completely unrelated, and I just gave it in. Now, here are some wise words um, from someone. There's one skill, and that is to maintain the, um, I messed up, the airway above all else. And that is an anesthetist, anesthetist is expected to exhibit any I've completely messed, messed this up. Basically, the idea is that airway management is the most important thing in anesthetists, not the induction of the anesthetic drug. So essentially, if you can't do basic airway management, you're like an engineer who can't replace a screw. So here's a quiz. I'm meeting up with a new patient named Bob, and Bob goes for a knee replacement surgery. Therefore, he requires general anesthesia. Do I just take him to the operation theatre and put him under anesthesia straight away? No. 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 Okay? Right. So the most important thing is pre-operative um, pre analysis. Everyone's usually excited for, oh, I'm going to put him into sleep, right? But that's not the idea. You need to gather some data before you take him to the operation theatre, and that is very important for even any specialty. So what are we looking for? Well, since we're talking about anesthesia, we're actually going to talk, we're looking at um, the mouth. Why do you think I might have included this image? Any clues? Yep. Okay. It shows you that there's different types of mouths that you need to take into account. Yes. <laughs> okay, that, that is. Anyone, anyone else want to put an input? No? That's okay. So the, the idea is that we're talking about airway management, which means I need to get the air, air somewhere, which is the mouth. So therefore, I might have to be putting a tube inside someone's mouth. Now, what does this show? Well, this shows multiple things, okay? As I go along the classes, it gets more difficult um, to manage the airway. And um, I'll show you why later. But first, I want to talk about um, the things we need to look for and look out for. So if you have a look here, um, there's things that, there's structures that are actually missing for each part. For example, here is the, um, the pillars, which are the tonsil pillars. And this pen is extremely bad. Tonsil pillars. This literally rubs it out. Over here is the uvula, which you can't see here for class three and class four. The top part here is a soft palate. Oh, yes, please. Pass on. Thank you. This part here is the uvula. This part is the pillars, as we talked about. And this part is the hard palate, which is the only thing you're going to ever see for a class four. And this means big, big problem, and I'll, just, and I'll showcase why later. Another thing is to check the environmental distance. And I can check this by, you know, I've got my chin here, and I've got my um, little bump over here, and I can check how many finger breaths is it away. And the, the decrease in finger breaths, the more complicated it becomes for airway management. The next thing is, can I check, can I move my head side to side? If they can't, it's gonna be a bit of a problem when I have to move the patient when they're under sleep also means that they could have a cervical spine injury, and I don't want to worsen that. The next is the thickness of the neck. Of the neck. Big thickness is good. Small thickness is bad, and I'll show you a case why later. Macroglossia is a large tongue. Yeah, thank you, David. <laughs> so we'll come back to that later, and you'll begin to see and connect the dots by yourself. And now quiz. Bob is, oh, let me rub this out first. Bob is going into surgery, 
and I induce him with lidocaine, not cocaine, and anesthetic along with propofol. Do I go back and play the new game of Slime Rancher 2? Yes, yes or no? No. Yes. The correct answer is yes. No, I'm joking. It is no. So, um, I did actually mention this here. I induced him with lidocaine and propofol. I'm going to give you some, a little, some background information. So, lidocaine reduces pain, and propofol is then um, injected along. But they both induce anesthesia. They both will go to sleep. So, how come, um, so how come I induce him with propofol straight after? Why is it not before? Why is it, why, why do I induce it after? Any thoughts? No? Okay, that's fine. So lidocaine reduces the pain, but weirdly enough, propofol actually causes pain upon induction. The reason why, I actually haven't researched that, and I will look into it later. But that is, that is why we actually sometimes mix drugs together, because sometimes things like this, propofol, causes pain upon induction. That's why sometimes when um, you ever have a surgery, they're like, oh, this might sting a bit, or well, it's because of the propofol. So, so the idea is, we got to interview, interview, um, intubate, sorry, intubate, which means we have to put a tube into someone's mouth. You know, they're gonna go to sleep, and we're like, like that, right? But how are they going to get their air inside to their lungs? How are they going to ve ventilate and how are they going to oxygenate? And if we can't do that, I, if you breathe, right, you can feel like you're actually moving something within you, inside yourself, right? When you, either that through the nose or through the mouth. But when you're under sleep, you can't do that. And that is an issue. So in a way, we need to integrate. integrate and um, sometimes we could just do this. I'm joking. We don't do that. So one way of doing this is a larginal airway mask. It's a very cool device, it looks something like this. And the way we insert it is like this. We put the airway mask right behind the tongue. So we've got to get past the tongue. Does anyone, um, remember when I talked about um, the, um, the pre-operative assessment we have to do? What would be the problem if I had a large tongue? You can't do that as easily, exactly, right? And why was if I had a small diameter of the neck? Can't get it in. Right? And as I talked about the classification system, right, where you could only see the hard palate, trying to get that in, that would be extremely difficult. But that's okay because the majority of people, they have normal mouths. So why does this work? Why do we need to do this? Well, well if you look at the shape, and if anyone does DT, right? This thing helps to create a positive pressure. Having a pressure, um, which also means that you prevent any air, any excess air around the throat. And the only air that's coming um, through is actually through this inflation line. Not the inflation line, sorry. The inflation line is actually to do with opening this thing up. But the main idea is the airway tube. The only thing that's coming out is the oxygen going through and any other gases as well. But let's say, you know, we have a bit of an issue, um, of course, um, we can't fill it through. There are also other methods, do not worry, there is the fiber optic endotracheal mask. It looks something like this. It has a thinner um, diameter compared to the larger mask, which is pretty fine fat. Only thing is, you cannot use this in emergencies. Do not use this in emergencies because it takes too long to insert. Do not use it when you have the cancers or tumors around the neck because if anything, if this, big, if the, if your neck begins to like, how do you say it? It becomes, it tends to like wrap around this endotracheal, um, um, this larger scope, because it's, you're interfering with the cilia, right? And it becomes, it gets a bit more trapped. And what this might cause is um, throwing up, like such as vomit. But that's okay. Fail to do that as well, we've got another method. And this is um, a airway, um, sorry. This is a surgical airway procedure. So, as before, we need to find out where this um, micromembrane is, and then we perform an incision, and then we can insert the tube in. Always make sure that, you know, we can, and there's a little diagram here, this tube. 
We put a tube in to take the air out so we know that the patient is aspirating, we know that air can go through. And then we can finally put in this catheter in so that we can put the tube in afterwards. So can't put it through the mouth, we can just put it through the throat. But as always, there's always complications in airway management. And this is discussed in the fourth national audit project, which is, um, which is discussed by anesthesiologists, where they look at big problems and then they make a big, big paper about it. Let's give that screen off. So here is an interesting case. The case is an elderly obese patient was anesthetized by a trainee um, for repair, blah, 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 blah. Um, here is his oxy oxygen saturation. And oxygen saturation is the amount of oxygen found in your alveoli. Technically, we want 97 and above. 97 is pushing it. <coughs> Technically, we want 100%. As well as that, um, we can see that the oxygen saturations fell to 70%. And then he suffered multiple organ failure. And then um, active vomiting occurred. So can anyone point out some complications that have occurred? Yes, it's you again. Vomiting. Vomiting, OK. Anything else? Uh, Doesn't matter if I repeated it. Yeah, go on. Which one? Organ failure. Organ failure, yep. Uh, I thought, forgot where organ failure and then is. Yeah. Anything else? Come on, guys, there's a lot. There's a lot of information here. Yes. Obese. Obese, yes. Anything else? Intestinal obstruction. Intestinal obstruction? Uh, I can't even find it. There it is. Yep. Anything else? Yep. 88% air oxygen saturation. Yep. 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 Anything else? Uh, it's not really much of a problem, that's pretty normal for people. What's ARDS? ARDS, I actually haven't looked into that, and I hope it's not arthritis. I'll check for you after the session. Any, anyone else? No? Uh, what about this big problem here? Communication skills. Because it's not all about bi um, you know, biological aspects, we've got the communication skills. Anything else? There's a there's a big one, you know. It's like it's at the start. Yeah, go on. Uh, strangulated hernia. That is also a problem. <laughs> Where is that? Yep. Actually, no, no. That is his operation. That does not matter. Anything else? Yep. Yep. Anything else? Yep. Trainee. Yes. Yeah, it is trainee. First line. First line. There you go. Yep. Anything else? That's okay, right? We have extracted a lot of information. There's a lot of problems um, discussed over here. So first thing, elderly and obese, right? If you're elderly and obese, it decreases the compliance of ventilation. And I will discuss about this. Sad thing is, I don't remember everything I did. I have, I have forgotten. Anyways, yes. So, if someone's obese, right, they're going to have a lot of fatty tissue build up. When you have a lot of fatty tissue build up, you're going to have a constriction around the diameter. We talked about how you know a smaller diameter, right, results in a harder in a harder um, airway management. Another thing is that obese patients tend to have a high BMI. People who have a high BMI tends to risk of heartburn. When you have heartburn, you actually begin to regurgitate contents, for example, your stomach acid. Imagine if I regurgitate my stomach acid onto the tube, it's going to dislodge it, which means that there is no secure placement for the airway. And this is actually um, used for people who have, um, um, for usually people with high BMI. They tend to have disrupted sleep because they can't ventilate, they can't get enough oxygen. And that's why we sometimes use machines to help them ventilate. Another thing is, Oxygen saturation fell below. We call this as hypoxia, means that there is not enough oxygen. And if there's not enough oxygen, it means there's not enough oxygen to the organs, which causes <coughs> multi organ failure. So, yeah, organs do not receive oxygen. Active vomiting prevents aspiration, which means the intake of the air. So, 
there is a lot of there is a lot of problems and this is a big 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 issue so how can we determine the complication and what i mean by determining the complication can we actually put it on a scale well for example the glasgow coma scale talks about um you know hopefully everybody has a maximum score of 15 best response you know spontaneous um can um um, can talk to um, someone, you know, quite easily, obeys commands, blah, blah, blah. If someone's in a coma, they can't do any of that. So that's a skill, you can use that. And recently, in a report on the um, 16th of August, 2022, we actually have um, something, um, um, which is an Oxford anesthesia chart. It discusses the scale on how we can determine the complication. So what's included? It's included age. And I might just label it for you. There's um, age if you're above 85, which is a score of three. But if you're less than um, three years old, it's a score of five. Why do you think that's the case? Why can a three-year-old have a higher score than it if someone is 85? Yeah, go on. Nope. Uh, higher, higher score on the complication means it's harder to um, airway intubate. Yes, again. Okay. Yes, yes. What has not fully developed? You have a smaller airway. There you go, smaller airway. Always linking you back to the airway. Another thing is the BMI. We're taking account the BMI, the weight and the height. We also take in the ASA. The ASA is something American related. I don't know why the UK has it. But um, this is a score of four if they have an ASA of four plus. An ASA of four means they have a severe disease that if they do not take under operation, they will may die. There's also an ASA of six, which is kind of cool. It means that they're a brain dead patient, which means we're collecting their organs. And yes, we do manage their airways because we want their organs to live as long as possible. Therefore, we need to interview to get the oxygen. Oxygen to the organs, respiration. The next thing, um, there are other tasks as well. Um, there's also the um, environment. You might not read it, it's environment. Why do you think environment and the place we interviewate interviewed a very important factor? Yes? Hazards, yes. Um, like well. Not pollution. Mm. Think of it like the theatre where, where I am conducting the intubation, yes. Well, is it like, I don't know, maybe the pillar's position where the bed is in that? No, no. Environment, not bed position. <laughs> yes? Um, having the right equipment sometimes. Exactly, right? If you're in elective surgery, it means everybody knows what's your issue, you come in, blah, blah, blah. Easy, right? Risk complication of one. If it's emergency, oh, hands on deck, I don't know what to do, we've got to get some random, uh, everybody's panicking. Well, hopefully not, right? But you're not as prepared as you may be. And the great thing about um, this chart, we can actually display it in a very fancy way. So we can know that, oh, what is the biggest risk the biggest risk here may be age, and there's also the idea of um, um, ventilation. There's a big problem with ventilation. How can we counteract that? So displaying it in a chart, we can see uh, the problems. We can also sum up the score. So this may question you. If we have a score of, let's say, 20 plus, do we want a junior trainee doing it out of hours and causing a case like this? No, right? Would rather have a consultant or a senior registrar. So having the score format means we may be able to determine what we can do. Could we have, um, let's say, someone um, well, assisting them or supervising them during the surgery and not doing our hours? Yes? How applicable is this sort of scoring system in a real life clinical environment? So there was a study on this. They had uh, some bar chart graphs and they found out that after a score of said something, they would introduce a um, registrar and they found that to be a bit more effective. Only problem is this is very recent and there's actually a talk about this on the 29th of September and I'll put this into a link, um, a live, um, um, a live um, let's say, a talk about it and they will discuss, um, the authors will discuss about this and their report some findings on it so you might be interested in um, looking into it. So that is airway intubation. And thank you for listening.